This is a story from the Washington Post from December of uh, 2016 discussing a Supreme Court case that the Supreme Court has decided to take back up and to review. This is a uh, a case that involves um, a, whole, a high profile murder case from Washington DC in 1984 where eight men were sentenced to the brutal sexual assault and murder of a woman in northeastern Washington, D.C. Now, let's do a little bit of history. This case actually involves Brady, which is why we have to go back to 1963, to the Brady case, and uh, understand kind of a little bit of the background of that particular case, because it's the issue that the Supreme Court is dealing with in the case that they're taking up now. In the Brady case, John Lee Brady and his companion Donald Boblet were being prosecuted for the for a murder. Brady said he was involved in the murder, but that Boblet was the one who actually committed the act of murder. And the prosecution had a statement from Boblet confessing that he had actually committed the murder. So they had a confession from Boblet. Now the confession was not issued at was not uh, presented at trial. So the issue is with Brady. When the prosecution has withheld criminal evidence that would uh, tend to prove that the defendant is not guilty, this is a violation of what they call the due process clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. So as we were just discussing, um, exculpatory evidence is evidence that uh, is something that would tend to justify or absolve the defendant. Basically, it's evidence that would evidence that would tend to prove the defendant is actually not guilty of the crime they're being accused of, and that they get this information. They, being the defense, gets this information by way of disclosure. So that means this is what the prosecution actually has to actively give the defense. Prosecutors actually have a duty of disclosure. We're going to discuss that a little later. But here in our picture, we see. We have a gun, let's say this is the murder weapon, and this murder weapon has a fingerprint, but the fingerprint doesn't belong to the defendant. This is the type of evidence you'd have to give over because it tends to prove the defendant wasn't one wasn't the one holding the gun, at least at one point. So you'd have to make sure that the prosecution got this uh, particular type of evidence. And as I said, prosecutors have a duty to disclose evidence that's favorable to the accused and... Um, also, this uh, duty extends to law enforcement as well. This doesn't mean that the, the defense has the right to everything that the prosecution has. Only things that are material and relevant to um, the, the defendant's defense, pretty much. And um, that would be um, evidence, as I said, that would tend to prove that the defendant is not guilty. Now back to our case um, in the Washington Post. So the Brady evidence that's being argued by the defense in this case says um, Supreme Court, you should reopen this case are the following. First of all, there was an eyewitness who um, said that they saw one person running away from the murder scene instead of a group of people running away from the murder scene and that this information was withheld from the defense that would tend to prove that a, one person may have done it rather than a group of people that may have done it. Secondly, um, there is a gentleman known as James McMillan who, after the 1984 murder, but before the trial, was, was arrested and later convicted of robbing and assaulting two other women in the same neighborhood using basically the same M.O., and then the same person, McMillan, several years later, in 1992, was convicted of sexually assaulting and murdering a woman a few blocks away from the alley where the victim was killed in the original case. Now, the uh, prosecution, on the other hand, arguing in um, the District of Columbia uh, uh, Appeals Court, which is before you get to the Supreme Court, basically saying, don't reopen this is reasoning that McMillan's later murders and crimes are irrelevant to what the prosecutors should have disclosed to the defense at trial. Their argument is that these McMillan's murders and prosecution have no bearing on the question of materiality to what the, the government should have actually uh, disclosed or told to the defense. They're saying that, look, 
at the time of the trial, some of these things hadn't even happened yet. The trial happened in 1985. Some of these things had not even happened yet. And a Brady violation cannot be predicted the, um, and it cannot be, sorry, predicated on the government's failure to do the impossible, which is enclose, uh, disclose evidence that is not yet in existence. So the prosecution is arguing, look, some of these things are not material or relevant because they didn't even happen yet. The defense is saying there are certain pieces of evidence that you did not disclose, which tend to prove that my client may have not been the one who committed this murder, or my clients should not, are not the ones who committed this murder. So now we're watching as this case goes up to the Supreme Court to see if this is going to reshape the landscape of Brady rules and Brady disclosures for um, the future.